order we decided yesterday, then we are starting with the supplementary item on preventing child sexual exploitation online. And it's going to be presented by our colleague Christopher Smith from uh, the United States uh, delegation. And Christopher, you have the right. You are, Thank you. I, I understood this uh, new expression for me. You are recognized as speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it so very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Yesterday's special OSCE PA meeting on combating sex and labor trafficking, a joint Belarusian United States IOM summit, was an extraordinary opportunity for us to look back at the progress that has been made, assess, assess where we are now, and then to think about what needs to be done to end the cruelty of modern day slavery. As lawmakers, there is a compelling need for us to more fully cooperate, not only on policy and sharing our laws with each other so we can learn from those laws and policies, as well as their implementation or lack thereof, but also to be very active on the operational side, making sure that law enforcement is collaborating as well, doing our oversight. Sometimes that means operationally as a, as a person, as an individual. In January of 2000, I received actionable information that eight Ukrainian women were being exploited by sex traffickers into two bars in Montenegro. The women had been lured there with promises of legitimate work, then forced into prostitution. One desperate victim, however, called her mother for help using the phone of the man that was exploiting her. When informed, I immediately called then Prime Minister, now President of Montenegro, Filip Vujanovic, who personally ordered an immediate raid on the bar. As a result, seven of the eight women were rescued and returned to their families in Ukraine. Tragically, the eighth woman was trafficked to Albania prior to the raid. Combating modern day slavery is everybody's business. We all know that, and I know you are committed to that. We need, however, to cooperate and to coordinate even more if we are to end this cruelty. Best practices need to be shared at every opportunity and implemented to the widest extent possible. As the rescue of the Ukrainian women demonstrated, actionable information needs to be acted upon without any hesitation or delay. I would point out to you and my colleagues that significant progress has been made since I authored landmark legislation in the year 2000 known as the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. It is our landmark law in America to combat sex and labor trafficking. Many of you in this room I know have written your nation's laws to combat trafficking. And this has been a team effort. Our law launched a bold strategy with a number of mutually reinforcing uh, provisions to provide rescue, shelter, political asylum, and other protections for the victims, long jail sentences and asset confiscation for the traffickers, and tough sanctions for governments that failed to meet minimum standards. The law created, and I encourage you to go online if you'd like, what we call the Trafficking in Persons Report. Just came out last week. It is a really an exhaustive effort to really chronicle what is happening everywhere in the world, including in the United States. I would point out that this book suggests that in the OSC region uh, last year, there were 11,416 trafficking victims identified, which is an increase. There, was, there were also approximately 1,700 successful convictions of traffickers in each of our respective countries. There needs to be more, but it shows that their trend line is good. The prosecutors are taking it seriously. And under the whole concept of prosecutorial discretion, more and more prosecutors are saying, this is a priority for me. Today's supplemental, and I want to thank the 54 parliamentarians from 25 countries who co-sponsored the resolution, builds on successful strategies and best practices deployed over the past two decades. I would note parenthetically that I offered the very first one at the Parliamentary Assembly in St. Petersburg, Russia, and 12 others since. And every time we try to look at a different aspect that needs to be highlighted and emphasized and hopefully implemented. Of course, this reminds us we need to robustly implement the OSCE 
action plan to combat human trafficking, including and especially special needs for children victims. According to the International Labor Organization, there are some two million children who are victimized by commercial sex trafficking every year. It is unconscionable in the extreme that children are today being reduced to commodities for sale, dehumanized and sold on classified ad websites. Child predators are using social media to exploit children, leading to sometimes to their death, but most often causing unbearable pain and suffering uh, for these children. Backpage is among those that today in the United States and in many of your countries sells children online. And the resolution admonishes each and every one of us to end this egregious practice by prosecuting them and also empowering the children and their families and their guardians to take action against those websites. It also recognizes the nexus with a child's access to online pornography and the empirical data, the mega-analysis it shows that especially teenage boys are more likely when they view violent pornography uh, to act it out and to be desensitized uh, to violence against women. And, and that is a terrible thing uh, to engender and to encourage among young people. We're out of time, but I thank you and I do hope you'll support it. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for your presentation. We have uh, three colleagues uh, for the general debate. It's Mr. Allison, Dan Allison from Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, the Canadian delegation also wants to thank the United States for bringing forward this important issue of online uh, sexual uh, exploitation. And uh, Congressman Smith, as well, to you. We thank you very much in this supplementary item. The sexual exploitation of children is a horrific phenomenon that is unfortunately present in all of our countries. The advent of the internet has further complicated and exasperated this per uh, pervasive problem. The supplementary item on preventing child sexual exploitation online acknowledges these important issues and the need for all OSC members to work together to combat child sex trafficking. Indeed, given the cross-border nature of trafficking, particularly via the internet, Collaboration among states and areas such as the OSCE Parliamentarian Assembly is crucial. Part of this collaboration should include the sharing of initiatives pursued by governments to combat child sexual exploitation in order to learn and develop best practices. Canadian initiatives include the establishment of a National Child Exploitation Coordination Centre by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which serves as a point of contact for investigations related to the sexual exploitation of children on the internet in Canada. A key function of this centre is the website cybertip.ca, a national tip line for reporting the online sexual exploitation of children. Cybertip.ca has also contributed to the development of technologies and training programs aimed at combating this phenomenon. In addition, cybertip.ca chairs the Canadian Coalition Against International Child, Internet, sorry, Child Exploitation, a voluntary multi-sector group focused on devising and implementing an effective national strategy to combat online check child sexual exploitation. Canadian parliamentarians have also been seized of this issue. For example, the House of Commons Standing Committee on the Status of Women emphasized the importance of addressing heightened cybercrime and cyber violence, which includes online child sexual exploitation in a recent report. Canada remains open to new and innovative approaches to combating this appalling crime, including legislation that would hold websites accountable for financially benefiting from the child sexual exploitation, as called for in the supplementary item. The Canadian delegation looks forward to working with our counterparts to root out and stop the evil that is online child sexual abuse. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. And the second round is for uh, Mrs. Morgensen. Hello, Morgensen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to highlight the practical problems that could arise from the application of the age verification technology mentioned in paragraph 20 of this resolution. A lot of privacy concerns have surfaced in connection with the digital economy bill that passed into UK law last April and is very similar to what is being proposed here. The new law will force sites to verify age or face penalties, while no duty is placed on the government to protect people's privacy, security, or defend them against cybersecurity risks that may emerge from the age verification systems themselves. Um, 
Verifying a user's age on the internet is a process that requires the transference of intimate personal data, which presents the danger of a database being created that will essentially store information on a user's sexual preference, leaving a digital footprint of a person's sex life. To understand the potential ramifications of such data collection and storage, we need only to look back at the 2015 hack of dating site Ashley Madison, where data identifying users was leaked online. A series of uh, resignations, breakups, and suicides followed. I believe three people committed suicide. Uh, now take this a step further and imagine the ramifications for LGBTQI persons in those OECD countries where those persons would be at risk if such information were to be leaked. Furthermore, I believe this may not even have the desired effect of protecting children from pornography, as there are ways of circumventing the age verification which are fairly simple, for example by using VPNs, proxies, or just plain torrenting. Kids are smart. They'll find a way. As the Open Rights Group, a privacy and free speech advocate put it, blocking websites is a disproportionate technical response to a complex social issue. Children need education, not censorship, to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you, Hara. Very interesting approach. And now is our Russian colleague, Kornienko. Alexei. Спасибо большое, уважаемые господа. В связи с в целом российская страна поддерживает проект, предложенный американской делегацией, но к данному проекту есть ряд замечаний, которые бы хотелось бы высказать, и замечания, которые, к великому сожалению, не устраняют носимые поправки к этому проекту. Проект представляет достаточно сырым и во многом дублирующий положение документов других организаций, занимающихся данной тематикой. Тема предотвращения сексуальной эксплуатации детей в онлайн-среде с использованием достижений в сфере информационно-коммуникационных технологий весьма актуальна. Однако попытки американских коллег претендовать на роль наставника в этой области выглядят по меньшей мере нелепо на фоне отсутствия каких-либо подвижек по делу о так называемых интернет-биржах усыновленных детей. По данным расследованиям, проведенных агентством Рейтер, как минимум 26 россиян стали жертвами этой схемы. Особую озабоченность в этом контексте вызывает сведения о том, что некоторые дети в результате деятельности преступников попали в руки педофилов, которые использовали их для производства порнографии. Что касается конкретных соображений по тексту проекта, непонятно, на основе анализа законодательства и практики каких государств автор проекта призывает, это пункт 8 и 17, государства, участники ОБСЕ, которые еще до этого не сделали, принять законы, позволяющие детям, которые рекламируются и продаются в онлайн сексуальное рабство, подавать в суд иски против сайтов, получающих финансовую выгоду от детского сексуального рабства. При использовании данной формулировки следует учитывать, что несовершеннолетний ребенок может обращаться в суд лишь через своих законных представителей опекунов. А формировка «Thudy Website», на наш взгляд, некорректна и требует непосредственного указания ответчика. Пункт 20, призывающий государства участников БСЕ, которые до сих пор не сделали, провести свою работу с частным сектором, требует внедрения новых технологий контроля для доступа к порнографическим сайтам, предотвращая таким образом детское рабство, требует конкретной аргументации. На основании изложенного полагаем, что проект требует доработки, но в целом наша страна поддерживает. Спасибо большое. Thank you, uh, Christopher, you are, you want to react for this? First of all, let me just make a point about the age verification. Um, the thrust of this resolution is to protect children. There are now studies after study after study that shows that violent pornography has a disproportionately negative effect on young males, uh, that they are more likely, not less, uh, to view rape and other horrific forms of, of sexual uh, harassment and, 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 um, and violence uh, in a much more positive way. One study said, and I quote, that higher risk adolescent males are more likely to be exposed to such media and when they are exposed, they are likely to be changed by such exposure, 
such changes in attitudes about the acceptance of violence against women. And there is one study after another that shows out of an abundance of caution, uh, we need to be on the side of child protection. Yes, there is no foolproof method for, for the age test. There's none. We know that some of the gambling sites have attempted to try to keep young people from their sites, uh, and some of that technology has worked. Uh, but I think when you weigh in the balance, uh, children who at a very, very young age, and even preteens, who might see violent pornography and then seek to act it out, uh, that the victims of that, the women or boys, whoever it may be, uh, we need to be in a preventive mode uh, and we ought to do it. The UK and others uh, are moving in the direction, have already moved in the direction of, of an age verification. We're looking at it in the United States. Uh, my hope is that we will develop best practices over time. But again, uh, the, these materials um, uh, really change the brain chemistry of young children in such a way, especially boys, and again, the mega-analysis couldn't be clear uh, that they are more, not lessly, but more likely to commit uh, these kinds of crimes. Let me also just say uh, about the standing that young people might have in court. Uh, that varies from state to state, country to country, I should say. And um, yes, they might need a guardian in some areas to uh, have standing before the courts. But again, this is all about trying to find a way forward to protect children. And these websites uh, very often use blackmail against young people. Uh, when a young person texts, sex texts back a picture of themselves and they say, if you do anything, we will alert others. Uh, there's also the grooming of, of trafficking victims online. Uh, when we had the Super Bowl, the big football classic in my state just a couple of years ago, uh, those who used online uh, capabilities, including social media and uh, some of these ad sites, were thwarted to a large extent by the governor and attorney general of New Jersey, a Republican, the governor and attorney general of New York, a Democrat, who tried through using the FBI and other means to ascertain where are these sites coming from, where are these children being exploited, uh, and there were numerous young people who were rescued uh, from rape because of that intervention. So I think, you know, I'm very much into civil liberties as well and protecting privacy. Uh, but we're talking about uh, a, a capability, age uh, verification, that is emerging, and I think uh, it could be done while protecting the anonymity of the person uh, that we are, uh, that may be going online. Remember, we're talking about teenagers under 18. We're Thank not you. talking about adults. We're talking about young people. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Let's go immediately to the amendments uh, in recognizing our colleagues. Uh, Hudson, Richard Hudson from the United States, for presenting the first, the very first amendment to the paragraph 14. Uh, Richard Hudson. I thank the chairman. This supplementary item preventing child sexual exploitation online through advances in technology cites two studies of the many available studies cataloging the harms to children of unrestricted online access to pornography. Just last year, the Journal of Interpersonal Violence released a study done in Bulgaria, England, Italy, and Cyprus of 4,564 young people aged 14 to 17 who view online pornography. The study found that online pornography made the boys more likely to be perpetrators of sexual coercion and abuse. An earlier study in the European Journal of Developmental Psychology had already shown that adolescent girls who report viewing pornography are more likely to report being victims of sexual harassment or forced sex at the hands of male friends or acquaintances. Another study out of the United Kingdom in 2012 by the Journal of Sexual Addiction and Compulsivity suggested children's underdeveloped brains uh, and lack of real-world experience of intimate relationships make them particularly susceptible to being influenced by viewing pornography. Yet another study in the Journal of Adolescence in 2011 found that adolescents in Sweden who were frequent users of pornography were significantly more likely to have sold sex than other boys their age. My amendment clearly states the unavoidable conclusion supported by these and other studies. Children with access to online pornography are made vulnerable, committing or being victimized by sexual exploitation. It's time to put in it's place common sense age sorry, verification Richard. systems. I ask for support for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Is there is any colleague against this amendment? Ms. Halora? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm not 100% against the amendment, 
I might be neutral on it, but um, I think that I would argue that the evidence is not as definitive on this issue as is being discussed right now in this room. Um, but more I would just like to say that I'm no fan of pornography personally. I don't think that it's good for kids to watch pornography. Uh, but this age verification technology, it doesn't work. That's the thing. Are we, it's civil liberties are important, yes, but if we're going to uh, um, use something that is going to lessen or put a damper on our civil liberties, then it should be something that's definitely going to work. And I fear that this method won't even have the actual effect of uh, stopping children from seeing porn. We need to educate more. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I understood you are not uh, speaking against the amendment, but uh, because there is a reaction, I think it's, it's useful to hear Richard, if you have uh, any comment. Um, sorry, Richard, not sorry. Oh, Richard, me. Christopher, sorry. Um, I do support the amendment. I think it, it further clarifies and expands on, you know, the evidence, no evidence is ever absolute. We went through, through decades of, of very responsible, seemingly, um, epidemiologists telling us there's no linkage to lung cancer and smoking. And, and it was accepted in the 60s, and it, was, it turned out that the evidence was overwhelming, and now we know it does. And people could smoke, but certainly it's, uh, uh, they know that there's a consequence. The evidence is very compelling, and I invite my colleagues to read it. We can provide it to you if we like. Um, there has been study after study to suggest it. And when you talk about age verification, nothing in this says Iceland will do this. It says we hope you will. Okay, thank you. Uh, colleagues, let's go then to the vote. Vote in favor of the uh, Richard Hudson and other colleagues' amendment. Vote in favor. Against? Abstentions? There is some? No, we colleagues. 40, 40 in favor, uh, none against, and two abstentions. The amended is adopted. Let's go immediately to our colleague uh, Gwen, Moore, Gwen Moore from the United States for the presentation of the amendment two. To paragraph 17. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am, um, have been listening very uh, carefully to the general debate and now to the debate that has occurred on these amendments. And I would like to say that I concur in the concern that has been raised by uh, the gentlewoman from Ireland, which is why uh, I have offered this amendment, which I hope Mr. Smith will accept, which um, <clears throat> which amends paragraph 17 uh, and calls on the OSCE participating states, which have not already done so, to enact laws allowing a child or former child victim to sue the classified advertising website, which knowingly or recklessly has reckless disregard for child's uh, exploitation. Um, uh, paragraph 18, of course, of the supplementary item calls on OSCE states to prioritize this pro prosecution, but we hope that the classified advertising websites have these policies, practices, and filters in place. So we're not going after websites that take, have these responsible uh, safeguards. I'm so sorry, my time has expired. But I would hope that the Mr. Smith uh, would fi uh, find this to be a friendly amendment. Thank you, colleagues. Sorry for the, for the short uh, time. There is uh, any colleagues who want to speak against the amendment? It's not the case. Um, Christopher, please. Thank you very much, position. Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, my good friend Gwen Moore for offering this um, amendment. I think it clarifies and strengthens the resolution, and I do appreciate it. Yield back. Let's move M to the vote. M M Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm seeking yeah, recognition. I, I do apologize. I said Ireland and I meant Iceland. Yeah, it's the, Iceland. It's, yes. It's yes, it's not. 
votes in favor of the amendment of Mrs. Moore. Please hold for a while. It's okay. Votes against. Abstentions. Sorry. The amended the amend, the amendment is adopted to forty. Zero against, five abstentions. I'm recognizing Naima Lanry for the presentation of the third amendment to the paragraph 22. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, add a new paragraph uh, after uh, 22, uh, saying that it calls on OCE participant uh, states to provide a decent system of shelter and uh, both legal and psychological support for the victims of child exploitation located on their territory. So we know that sometimes victims live in a family and they have shelter, so for them it's necessary to provide uh, legal and uh, 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 psychological support. But there are also children uh, who are victims who have no shelter, who are uh, homeless, uh, for, uh, for instance, unaccompanied minors uh, who are uh, victims of uh, human trafficking and who just arrived uh, on the territory. And for them, it's also necessary to provide also uh, shelter. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Is uh, there any position against this amendment? Christopher. Thank you. I want to thank the gentlelady from Belgium for her, am her amendment. It strengthens it. You know, Throughout all of our countries, there is a lacking of shelter for trafficking victims in general. And for child victims, uh, it is especially acute. So I think this strengthens it. And of course, legal and psychological support. Who needs it more than those kids, so, those children? So thank you for offering it. Thank you, Christopher. Then let's move to the vote, to the amendment. Last one, the third, uh, presented by Na Naima Landry. Vote favor. Please hold for a minute. Thank you. Votes against? None. Abst uh, sorry. Abstentions? Uh, the amendment is adopted at 51 in favor, one against, and one abstention. This was the last uh, amendment to the Supplementary item uh, proposed by Christopher Smith. Let's go to the vote, the general vote on the whole of the document. Vote in favor of the supplementary item at, at, this, at this moment after the amendments. Votes in favor. Uh, against? It's not the case. Abstentions? Uh, okay. Mm. Uh, um, the supplementary is adopted. Thank you. 43 votes in favor. No against, one abstention. Thank you, colleagues. We are passing immediately to the next supplementary item. It's Isabel Santos on death penalty. Whenever you want to have five minutes. Sorry. Five minutes. Thank you, Senor Presidente. 
A few days ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the abolition of the death penalty in Portugal. This historical framework remembers us how much the evolution of humanity is slow. What is really impressive is that after a century and a half, despite the increase of the number of the abolitionist states, this penalty is still applied in so many states around the world and is still applied in states of OSU region. And it's with astonishment that we see some abolitionist states launching discussion on the return to this punishment. Every person has the right to life, a right that cannot be suspended for any reason. The death penalty is a cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, an act of torture, unacceptable to states that respect human rights. Persistent of this death penalty, of the death penalty in OSCE member states represents an intolerable breach in the participating states' commitments. Over the years, in the OSCE Parliamentarian Assembly, we have adopted a number of resolutions recommending the abolition of death penalty. I sincerely wish this will be the last resolution that we debate on this subject. But I also assure you that we will not give up this fight until the death penalty is abolished on OSCE region and on a global scale. Recovering the words of the famous French writer and abolitionist Victor Hugo, saluting Portugal in 1867 for abolishing the death penalty and becoming an example for Europe. In his words, I will tell you that it is time to declare death to death, life to life. I appeal to all of you to vote in favor of this supplementary item and all the amendments submitted. And I want to thanks to Mrs. Langerie the sponsor of all the amendments to this supplementary item for her contribution to the improvement of this document. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. We have uh, for the general uh, debate uh, some colleagues. Uh, Mr. Fautili from Italy. Grazie, Presidente. Eh, noi interveniamo innanzitutto per dire che eh, sosteniamo la risoluzione suppletiva presentata dall'onorevole Santos. Innanzitutto perché riteniamo che la lotta contro la pena di morte è una questione di civiltà. La pena di morte nega in radice la dottrina dei diritti dell'uomo, che è fondata sul rispetto per la vita e sulla dignità degli esseri umani. Giustamente all'Italia viene universalmente riconosciuto un ruolo di avanguardia nella battaglia per l'abolizione della pena di morte. Il nostro è un paese del tutto abolizionista, lo è sempre stato. L'onorevole Santos ricordava quando questa pena è stata abolita nel Portogallo nel 1860. Io voglio ricordare che in Italia già il Granducato di Toscana nel 1786 abolì la pena capitale. Certo, nel mondo molti passi avanti sono stati fatti da allora e come emerge dall'ultimo rapporto di Amnesty International nel 2016 sono state 1032 le esecuzioni capitali registrate in confronto alle 1634 del 2015. Quindi più della metà dei Paesi ha abolito la pena di morte di diritto o di fatto. Gli ultimi dati aggiornati, l'ultimo mese di aprile del 2017, parlano chiaro. 104 Paesi hanno abolito la pena di morte per ogni reato. 
sette paesi l'hanno abolita salvo che per reati eccezionali quali quelli commessi in tempo di guerra. 30 paesi sono abolizionisti di fatto, poiché non vi, registrano, non vi si registrano esecuzioni da almeno 10 anni, oppure hanno assunto un impegno a livello internazionale a non eseguire condanne a morto. Pertanto in totale 141 paesi hanno abolito la pena di morte nella legge o nella pratica. 57 paesi però mantengono in vigore la pena capitale, ma quelli che eseguono condanne a morte sono assai di meno. Tuttavia la pena capitale rimane una piaga per l'eliminazione della quale la comunità internazionale deve ancora impegnarsi a fondo. Quindi la strada da percorrere è ancora lunga e oggi dobbiamo ribadire con forza e non ci dobbiamo stancare di farlo, come ha sottolineato l'Onorevole Santos, che gli Stati, tutti, nessuno escluso, devono interrompere questa inutile barbaria. La pena di morte va estirpata e abolita perché è una pena barbara e incivile. La morte è sempre in ontologica opposizione a qualsivoglia idea di giustizia e prima ancora di dignità umana. È inaccettabile che uno Stato al pari di chiunque altro arroghi a sé il diritto di vita o di morte su un individuo. Concludo con l'auspicio che questo cammino intrapreso ormai da molti anni dall'Italia ma anche dall'OSCE possa proseguire con sempre più vigore e determinazione, in sinergia con tutti gli altri Paesi e ricordando soprattutto a noi tutti che la ferma e incondizionata opposizione alla pena di morte non può essere fine a se stessa, ma deve essere solo un elemento di una battaglia generale Prego, per la dignità umana. Grazie. Grazie, grazie caro. Heidi Fry, your turn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I want to thank uh, Isabel Santos for bringing forward this supplementary item. I, 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 I really and truly support it, and I think it's time that we looked at removing the death penalty in all of the OSCE participating states. Uh, Canada had its last execution on the 11th of December, 1962. And it, 15 years later, we made it into law, but we had never in, executed anyone since then. Um, we were just one of 16 countries in 1976 to abolish the death penalty. And since then, Canada has been a strong advocate for abolition of the death penalty in countries around the world, because we recognize that such punishment is contrary to the fullest expression of human dignity, and it is also also contrary to sound criminal justice policy. It has never deterred any criminal from committing a capital crime. So we believe that the OSCEPA should strive always for the highest protection of human rights, including the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, which is written into the Canadian Constitution. We also think that this is, this is cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Uh, we believe that the death penalty is not an effective deterrent to criminality, nor does it account for the fact that any justice system, no matter how well-intentioned, will make mistakes. And in fact, in Canada, even though we did not have the death penalty, we had three, four people who were committed of murder and who, of course, spent life imprisonment. But it was discovered in each instant that they were the, did not commit murder. After DNA came about, it was found that they were wrongly jailed for the life sentence. But if we had had a death penalty, these people would have been killed for something that they did not do. Uh, we believe that we want to practice what we preach. So in Canada, any Canadian who is accused of a criminal offense, it is a capital offense in a foreign country, we ask for clemency for them. And if we have people who are living in Canada who are not Canadian citizens, when we deport them for capital crimes, we ensure that they do not have the death penalty or we will not deport them for criminal crimes. And so we want to thank Ms. Santos um, for putting forward the supplementary item uh, and moving forward the important cause of abolition of the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Do you want to react, uh, Isabel, or is it okay? <laughs> Only for underline that, of course, Tuscany was the first state, as we can say, that abolished uh, that penalty before Portugal, Tuscany, and San Remo. I don't know if the delegation is here, but I want to, to, do, uh, this, uh, to give this information. And of course, this is um, a fight that we must give up, till the, uh, stand with, the, uh, with this fight till the end, 
because it's in intolerable. It's totally intolerable that in the OAC states or in another state will remain this penalty that is inhuman, cruel, and um, an act of torture. It's unacceptable in countries with patterns of commitment of, with, uh, with human rights that we have. And uh, of course, undermine all our commitments with human rights. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, Naima Landry, you could start with your first of three amendments. You have one minute. Yes, uh, as we know, uh, world uh, we are uh, each year more uh, countries abolish the death penalty. Last year, uh, 104 countries worldwide abolished the death penalty by law, and. Uh, uh, 141 countries abolished the death penalty in law or in practice. However, this is uh, in contradiction with the alarming increase of, uh, in the application of the death penalty. In 2015, at least 1,634 uh, uh, people were executed, which is an increase of 54% uh, in comparison, uh, comparison uh, to the uh, year before uh, that. And uh, 2016 marked a lower number in executions with uh, 1,032 executions, but it's ne nevertheless it in indicates uh, 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 aver uh, that a higher average than the past decennium. And uh, therefore, the present resolution is uh, very much necessary. So I also want to thank Mrs. Santos for her resolution, which is really necessary. But I want to uh, um, uh, add these uh, numbers be, uh, and say that it's ne necessary and add those alarming increase uh, in the application of the death penalty by adding the, this text. Thank you, Naima. Is any colleague who want to speak against the amendment? It's not the case. Uh, Isabel? I second this amendment, uh, and of course, even if it was only one sentence or only one case, it's not a matter of numbers, it's a matter of moral, it's a matter of values, but uh, of course, numbers are also important to us to remember um, the, the weight of this issue. And of course, I'm fully uh, in favor. Thank you, Isabel. Let's go to the board, colleagues, for the first amendment. The amendment one. Uh, sorry, is there. Somebody asking for the floor as a point of order? Uh, sorry, Russian is asking for the floor. Sorry, please, colleague. По первой поправке, да. Я целиком поддержу предыдущего оратора, но прежде всего комплиментарно отношусь к автору этого совершенно уместного документа, который мы сейчас обсуждаем. Мне кажется, редакционно было бы правильно, то есть обязательно нужно включить в нашу резолюцию вот эти цифры страшные, которые здесь приведены, смертных, реализованных смертных приговоров. Но мне кажется, это было бы уместно включить в первый пункт. Мы как бы обрисовываем проблему, а затем уже идем... Вот в редакционном плане это было бы, наверное, более правильно. Но если высокое собрание не согласится с этим мнением, то мы все равно проголосуем за то, чтобы эти цифры были внесены в пункт 9. Понятно, да? То есть внести цифры, смертные приговоры, и сколько их было, в каком году, в первый пункт, где мы говорим «выражаем сожаление» по поводу того, что 150 лет, а затем вместе с тем сейчас у нас вот такое происходит. А не в девятый пункт. Спасибо. Yeah. Uh, I hope you, you all understood that there is a question not on the content of the amendment, just in the putting on place in a different uh, place in the, in the uh, supplementary item. I agree. I uh, it's no... <laughs> For me, it's okay. For, for the proposer, it's okay. For the, uh, for the proposer of the supplementary, it is? I agree. Okay, let's vote. Let's vote to the, for the content. Is there any objection? Yeah, is there, there is any objection on this idea of replace, of relocate the content in another part of the, no? Then we pass to the vote on the content of the first amendment to Naima. Vote in favor.
vote against the first amendment? Abstentions? There is 45 in favor, uh, non uh, uh, against, non, uh, non abstentions. It's passed. Thank you. Naima, your second amendment, please. Yes, the second uh, amendment, uh, uh, which to add it uh, after uh, paragraph 10, uh, that the resolution of the UN General Assembly on the abolition uh, of the death penalty are useful and a very important, important instrument uh, in the international campaign against the death penalty, considering that each country has uh, to acknowledge their uh, stance uh, on this uh, matter. So that's why I want to add this text. Thank you, Neymar. Is any colleague uh, wants to speak against this amendment? No. Um, Isabel? I agree. You sign. You sign again. <laughs> of course, you sign, you sign the amendment. Okay, let's pass then to the vote. Uh, votes in favor of the amendment two. Votes against? Abstentions? It's 45 0, zero that the, the amendment is adopted. Thank you. And Naima, finally, your very last uh, amendment and the last for the supplementary item, amend, Amendment 3. Yes, uh, we uh, are deeply alarmed by st uh, statements of states that have already abolished the death penalty that uh, the uh, statements are to uh, reinstate the, the, those, uh, this uh, sentence, and this would be a violation of uh, the international treaties, uh, and, and it is necessary for the international com uh, community, and so for our uh, parliamentary assembly of the OCSC as well, um, to at least uh, condemn this declaration, because we, we see that also in OCE member state, there are such de declaration of having um, uh, reinstalling back the death penalty. And this is very al alarming us very much. So that's why I hope this, uh, um, this paragraph will, uh, hope, uh, by this adding this paragraph, I hope they will not go over to the action. And so that we strongly condemn this. Thank you, uh, colleague. Uh, is there anyone who wants to speak against the amendment? It's not the case. Uh, Isabel? I'm in favor, of course. Okay. Let's pass immediately to the vote of this very last amendment. Votes in favor. Votes against? Abstentions? It's adopted. Let's move then to the vote of the general supplementary item as it is after the approval of, of these three amendments. Votes in favor of the, of the text as a whole. Votes in favor. Against? No. Abstentions? Okay. It's done. Congratulations, Isabel. It's approved by unanimity. Thank you. Colleagues, we are passing to the third uh, supplementary item. I am I'm, I'm leaving the chair because I have a, an amendment. And it's uh, our dear colleague, Ivana Dovesova, who is taking the chair for, for a while. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move uh, to consideration of the next supplementary item referred to us by the Standing Committee. The name is Multiculturalism, the role of culture values in development of democracy in the context of globalization. 
as I have uh, an amendment uh, to this item. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, first of all, before speaking about amendments, I would like to welcome uh, here Mr. Mirkishili from Azerbaijan and I give him floor as a sponsor of this draft resolution. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, dear colleagues. The first of all, I want to thank all my colleagues who supported these supplementary items. And I think that uh, the multiculturalism as a new tools to achieve the high level of the democratization, it will be useful in the future also because to enrich the tools of to reaching the democratization and to, uh, to the new level of the development, I think we need for that once in all over the obvious regions also. So the problem of organizing a dialogue among various cultural traditions in national framework is a new challenge for all countries. Cultural pluralism or ideology of multiculturalism is becoming more actual under the conditions. Multiculturalism suggests peaceful and trustful coexistence of various cultures in a single country. Multiculturalism is a concept that suggests equality and coexistence of all cultures. It's an integration of cultures without getting assimilated. So in addition, if, if traditional liberal ideology is based on protection of the equal rights of the individuals, but multiculturalism moves another step towards and assigns these rights to collective individuals, representative of these or other cultures. I want to continue my speech with the very famous and very, very interesting words of the former UN Secretary General Butros Kali. And he said that economy, finance, communication are increasingly globalized. The world faces global challenges. All we lack is globalization of democracy. So the best way to achieve it is to support cultural diversity, and I call it multiculturalism. That's why. Uh, I call all the countries, or my countries, just uh, participating states to embrace the democratic development of the values of multiculturalism as an essential element in a meaningful discussion on questions of security and coexistence. And we call to use values of multiculturalism to build confidence and promote security in the OECC regions. That's why I call my all of the colleagues to support these supplementary items, and I see, I believe that it will be very useful for the, all the countries also. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and just now I open the debate on our uh, speakers list. There is only one speaker, so I would like to call you someone who wants to be added to the speaker, speaker's list to do it just now. Uh, and the first, I would like to give the floor uh, Mrs. Uh, Hedy Fry from Canada to, to speak about uh, this uh, uh, draft resolution uh, of, this, uh, of this supplementary item. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Canada has embraced the concept of multiculturalism for over 45 years in our country. It is, in fact, an official piece of legislation called the Multiculturalism Act, in which we encourage all of the diverse people that live in Canada, all the immigrants or refugees, all the people that have lived there for hundreds of years, to embrace their culture, their language, their own values. At the same time, it stipulates that if that value or that cultural practice endangers society as a whole, then it will not be allowed to happen. So that in Canada, for instance, while we encourage everyone to have religious beliefs and to live their lives the way they would like to, we also make sure that a belief like, for instance, female genital mutilation is a criminal act in Canada. So there is a limit to how much it happens, but it has created for Canada a country in which there is not only mutual tolerance of each other, but it has become mutual respect because people in Canada realize over 45 years that what others bring to the table benefits the country as a whole. It makes us a global country. We appreciate the other cultures of the world. We appreciate the languages and the values of the world, and we embrace them as our own. So I really support this concept. I like that it's a generic idea. 
Thank you very much. And just now I would like to give the floor Mr. Onyshenko from Russia. The floor is yours. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Российская делегация благодарна господину Меркешвили за уместность данного документа. Тем более, что в первом пункте нашей предполагаемой резолюции нет ссылок на то, что ОБСЕ уже на эту тему высказывалась. И мне кажется, только поэтому можно было вносить эту резолюцию. Для многонационального государства, коим является Россия, еще раз высказаться на тему того, что мы за полную транспарентность, равные права и предотвращение дискриминации по языку, по религии и так далее, более чем уместно. Но нас очень беспокоит то, что предлагаемая поправка к данному документу широко трактует понятие мультикультурализма, и мы заранее резервируем то, что если она будет принята, мы будем голосовать за эту резолюцию, но если будет принята поправка, которая есть здесь, мы, к сожалению, будем воздержаться от этого документа. Поэтому я думаю, что эта поправка, которая предлагается в пункту 9, делает неприемлемой эту резолюцию для многих стран Европы входящих в ОБСЕ, но российская делегация не приемлет это расширение того уже устоявшегося понимания мультикультурализма. Спасибо. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker is Mr. Ignacio Sanchez. The floor is yours. Uh, gracias, uh, Presidenta. Uh, el asunto yo creo que ha sobrevolado sobre la reunión de esta mañana y ha sido encuadrado perfectamente por la intervención de Heidi Fry. El, el multiculturalismo es un valor de las sociedades complejas, pero nunca puede ser la excusa para no aceptar un estándar común en materia de derechos humanos. Tenemos unos valores comunes y compartidos, muchos de ellos expresados en la Declaración de Derechos del Hombre de las Naciones Unidas, y a partir de ahí hay eh, peculiaridades culturales que tienen que ser observadas. Pero nunca se puede utilizar el multiculturalismo como una cobertura para erosionar o para no cumplir nuestras obligaciones en el estándar común de derechos humanos. Les pongo un ejemplo sencillo. La mutilación genital femenina... Es una práctica cultural en muchos países, pero no podemos aceptarla como parte de la expresión del multiculturalismo sencillamente porque ataca los valores esenciales de nuestra civilización y del concepto de dignidad humana. Por tanto, veamos la apreciación del multiculturalismo como un valor para la sociedad, pero siempre teniendo cuidado de que no vaya a ser utilizada como excusa para crear desigualdades, por ejemplo, entre sexos, desigualdades entre orientaciones sexuales, desigualdades que tengan la etiqueta de multicultural para al final venir a perjudicar una posición de igualdad en derechos humanos. Hay un estándar común de nuestra civilización, que son los derechos humanos, derechos fundamentales, expresados en muchos instrumentos internacionales como los de la ONU y como los de la OSCE, y hay una apreciación una valoración positiva del multiculturalismo como una forma de enriquecer nuestras sociedades complejas, pero siempre con un respeto de ese estándar esencial de derechos humanos. Gracias. Thank you very much because uh, I don't have any other people who want to speak, so I close the debate and give the floor Mr. Tahir to react on uh, that. Sorry. Uh, may I may I, may I take floor please? Sorry, you didn't see me. Uh, sorry, yes. So, I go back. Turkey is on the turn. The floor is yours. Excuse me. Thank you very much. 
It is also my belief that protection of rights should apply equally to all human beings, regardless of gender or orientation. This amendment supports the protection of rights to only a certain segment of society, uh, as in the oral amendment in the morning from our Belgian colleagues. Uh, we define the situation LGBTQ and I. By effort, we cannot find any letter from the alphabet to define the situations. Instead, I would prefer a holistic approach if we are to include the protection and promotion of rights. Thank you. So, thank you for your uh, speech. And just now, I gave the floor, Mr. Tahir, to react on this debate. On this debate. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you to my colleagues who made a very nice speech, especially the, the Canada Russians and my Spanish colleagues also. And I just want to note that actually, I think also this is the, maybe the first document in the OECC that who is indicated to use the multiculturalism like a tool to reach the democratic levels. And there is a, more than 2,000 nations in the world and there is approximately less than 200 countries in the world. It means that the number of the nations is sometimes more than the number of the countries. It means that the cultural diversity should be, and it was, the, one of the source of the national development. So, for example, today's the Canada, I think that most of the development level of the Canada, it depends on the migrants' cultures and the diversity of the culture. The same, we can uh, say the same about the Russia also. Because when you have the, the different cultures and when they have the, you are using these different cultures to the advantages that country and government is of course developing and enriching us on. That's why actually uh, I want to note that as it is the, my first supplement items and I think it's one of the first documents is the OCCS. So I just indicated multiculturalism one of the common cultures because I believe that uh, maybe after this, if we admit, if we vote these supplemental items, I believe that in the future, maybe there will be a lot of documents that will indicate the subgroup of all the cultures because there is a lot of subgroups of the cultures. Multiculturalism is like the diversity of the culture and to use this to not only for the development, but only to, uh, to meet the many challenges that we have in front of our countries as well. Thank you very much for your reaction. And just now I will move to consideration of the amendment submitted to the draft resolution. Copies of the amendment have been made available. The correct version is entitled AS17 SE7, SI7 amend. So because the author, author of this or sponsor of this amendment is Mr. Sanchez, I would like to give you the floor to present this amendment. The floor is yours. Gracias, eh, Presidenta. La enmienda, la enmienda se refiere a una de las expresiones eh, del la problema que yo he evocado en mi intervención eh, general. A veces se contraponen, yo creo que de una manera que no es correcta, los valores de los derechos humanos y la extensión de los derechos fundamentales, especialmente los que tienen que ver con la diversidad sexual, se contraponen a lo que se llama eh, valores familiares o family values. Yo creo que hay ahí una cierta distorsión eh, con la que se pretende confrontar modelos que en muchas sociedades conviven sin ninguna dificultad. Se puede considerar que en España o en Suecia o en Holanda o en Canadá no hay valores familiares porque se prevean otros tipos de familia. Yo creo que no y a lo que viene a reconocer o a intentar reconocer esta enmienda es que, como decía antes, bajo ningún concepto el, la idea de multiculturalismo puede servir para erosionar o para dificultar el ejercicio de derechos de diversidad sexual. Nada más. Thank you very much, and I would like to ask if is uh, someone here who wants to speak uh, against this amendment. Belgium, please. Yes, um, I don't want to speak against, but uh, in the same thinking as this morning, I would uh, propose an oral amendment to uh, change LGBT and uh, LGBTQI as we uh, voted this morning already. Thank you.
So I can accept it as an oral amendment, is it right? Is there anybody here who wants to speak against this oral amendment? Any or any objections to that? So uh, an objection. It's Russian. Austria. 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 So the amendment can't be considered. Austria. So they have an objection. If there is objection, the amendment can be accepted. So uh, just now. I would like to ask if there is anyone who wants to speak against this amendment number one. Uh, Russian Federation. Уважаемые коллеги, мы еще раз хотим от нашей делегации обратить внимание о том, что сам проект резолюции отвечает современным вызовам и достаточно достойно представлен. Но повторяем еще раз, что наша делегация призываем всех наших коллег проголосовать против этой поправки, потому что она никак не сшивается с понятием мультикультурализма, который сейчас мы рассматриваем, и э, является таким лишним э, и неприемлемым для нашей страны в данном проекте резолюции. Спасибо. Thank you for your opinion, and just now it's time for uh, Mr. opinion. So the floor is yours. Uh, I want also to thank you to the amendments uh, sponsors also who made it and who signed it. But I, I have the different view and I want to uh, say it if it's possible. So I seriously took note of the amendment and wish to share uh, my view as a principal sponsor of the supplement items. The subject matter of the amendment represents one of the few issues that is regularly on our agenda both at the Parliament Assembly and at the national level. It shows the relevance of the topic for the OECC agenda for enhancing culture of tolerance and inclusiveness. Yet, it should be underlined that the supplementary items under consideration deliberately avoid to touch upon specific groups and of tolerance and discrimination against any specific subgroup of segment of society. It envisages broader approach to multiculturalism and democracy which of course encompass entire societies with all their segments. It is therefore the view of the author of the resolution that the proposed amendment is not in line with the overall aim uh, of the documents. And in, in light of the fact that there is no mention of any specific group in the draft, insertion of proposed amendment could be harmful to integrity of the document and maybe conceive it as a discrim discriminatory by many other social groups. This is that we should definitely avoid. So I think also that uh, there is a the specific and there is a lot of subgroups uh, inside of the cultures of multiculturalism. And we think about that in this context, I encourage my fellow parliamentarians to consider reflection of the LGBT issue in other more relevant occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just now, uh, I would like to start the vote so uh, please, who is in favor of this amendment number one, please raise your card. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Who is against, please raise your card. Thank you. Any abstentions? So here are the results. 26 votes are in favor, 18 against, two uh, abstentions. So uh, this amendment number one was adopted. Because it was the only amendment which we have to this uh, draft resolution, uh, I would like to start the vote about, about this whole resolution, uh, this, uh, this amendment number one. So, who is uh, in favor of this whole resolution as it was amended? So, please raise your cards. Yeah. 
Thank you. Who is against? Please raise your voting cards. Abstentions, please. So these are uh, results. 32 votes are in favor, five is, are against, and five abstentions. So uh, this uh, draft resolution was uh, adopted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we finished the third resolution, and I would like uh, to express to thank you for supporting us in making good progress today. And because uh, we have only 20 minutes left, I would like to finish our work today. And I would like to uh, uh, tell you that uh, we will continue tomorrow uh, morning at 11.30. So please... Uh, be here tomorrow morning and have a nice day. Goodbye.